Okay, folks, so here is the next lesson on EM induction, and where we're going to be looking at charged particles in magnetic fields. Now, this is lots of applications, including things like particle accelerators and mass spectrometers, which are important for us because they can be found on various different robotic spacecraft, including Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity. So let's go ahead and have a quick recap of what we looked at last lesson. We said that if we have charged particles moving through a conductor, like a wire, and we can model the current, in this case here is going into the page, so we've got the cross showing that it's going into the page. Because you have moving charged particles, and those moving charged particles generate a magnetic field around themselves, that magnetic field will interact with the magnetic field between two poles, so a uniform magnetic field. And we looked at Fleming's left-hand rule. And this is that if we know the direction of the field, B, we know the direction of the conventional current, so positive flow of charge, then we can work out what the force will be on that wire. And if we take a look at this example here of the model, you can see on the screen in the background, I have my field going from top to bottom. I can model my field direction with my first finger, the motion or the force with my thumb, and the current direction with my second finger. So I point my finger down in the direction of the field, my second finger into the page where the current is, which means my thumb is pointing from right to left. And that shows the direction of the force. And if we took a look at a video of this in reality, we can see that when I do actually have a conductor in a magnetic field, then once it's hooked up so that I have got charged particles moving through, I do get a force being exerted. And this is exactly the same scenario that we had before. So I have got my current, I've got my field, and we can see originally it went right to left. If I change the polarity, reverse the current direction, all I'm doing is flipping my second finger and so my force is now acting in the opposite direction. But what about when I've got a single charged particle? Well, if the force on the wire was caused by moving electrons or moving charged particles, then a single charged particle that's moving will also generate its own magnetic field and will also experience a magnetic force when it interacts with a uniform magnetic field. So in this example here, my uniform magnetic field is going into the page or the screen and my charged particle, positive here, so it is conventional current, is moving left to right. So I can tell my current is this direction, my field is going into the page. Fleming's left-hand rule tells me that I should be expecting the force to be acting upwards. So the instant this charged particle enters the field, that force is acting up. But the resultant path of my charged particle is a little more interesting. It follows a circular path. And the reason for that is we need to think about it at every point in its motion. As it enters, it's moving in this direction. It experiences an upwards force, so the direction of its motion changes. It changes velocity. Same speed, different direction. Then, a fraction of a second later, it's moving this way. Now I'm having to change the direction of my current with my left hand rule, and my resultant force is acting this way. That leads to a change in direction. And if I keep on doing this, then what I end up getting is circular motion where that magnetic force is acting as my centripetal force. And this is really, really useful. First, to show how it can be useful, we need to work out an equation that allows us to figure out the physical parameters of its motion. So basically, what is the radius of that circle going to be? And if I go to my equation for the force in a current carrying wire, F equals BIL, where B is my magnetic field strength in Tesla, I is my current, and L is the length of the conductor in the field, 
Well, I can tweak this to get the equation for a single charged particle. I know that my current is just the rate of flow of charge, or Q over T. And if I've got a conductor with a charged particle that is moving through it, if that there is my distance L within the field, well then, my length is just going to become the speed of my charged particle times the time it takes to go through that field. So that becomes V times T. So now my force is equal to my magnetic field strength or magnetic flux density times Q over T times V times T. And my T's are going to cancel out. And that gives me the equation for the force on a single charge that is moving. F is equal to B, my flux density, times the charge in coulombs, times the speed in metres per second. And then if we want to actually work out what the radius of the circular path is, remembering that in this case here with my negative charged particle, as it moves through this magnetic field going into the page, get my left hand rule out, field first finger is going into the screen or the page, second finger current at the top is moving in this direction. So I'm going to experience a force towards the centre of the circle. That centripetal force. We know the equation for EM force is BQV, just work that out. We also know that the equation for centripetal force is equal to MV squared over R. And if we equate these to each other, if BQV is equal to MV squared over R, then we can do a little bit of rearranging to find R. R is going to be equal to M v squared over b q v and that v is going to cancel there to give me my radius equation r is equal to m v over b q where m is the mass of my particle v is its speed b is the flux density or the magnetic field strength and q is the charge of my particle So let's have a quick go at a practice question then. An electron with a velocity v of 2.5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second enters a uniform magnetic field strength of 20 milliteslas. Okay, so that is my b. And remember, it's milli, so it's times 10 to the minus 3. What is the radius of the circular path it will follow? And they've given us the charge and the mass of an electron. So I just bring up my equation, R is equal to mv over bq, and I just plug my numbers into that. So that is going to be equal to my mass, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. I have my velocity here of 2.5 times 10 to the 6 all divided by my field strength, which is 20 times 10 to the minus 3, multiplied by the charge of a single electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And remember, it doesn't matter that it's negative. That's just telling us the direction of the force we're expecting. When you plug those numbers in, you get an answer of 7.117 times 10 to the minus 4 meters and the smallest significant figures given to us were two sig figs so our answer should also be to two sig figs
So now we need to think, how can we apply this in a really useful way? And the key is to then think about how all these different factors are going to affect the radius of that circle, or rather the size and shape of the path it's going to take. So here I have my electron and I have the normal path an electron will take. We need to think about how all the various factors of this radius equation will affect that path. So what's going to happen if I increase the velocity? Well, increasing velocity means I have a higher number on the top. So what that's going to do is increase my radius, or rather the effective circle that my particle is traveling in is going to be larger. It's going to open out that path. And that makes sense. If it's moving faster, then it's going to have traveled a bit further for each change in that force. What will happen if we increase the magnetic field strength then? Well, this time, if we're increasing field strength, then the number on the bottom is getting bigger, so my resultant R is going to be smaller. Or rather, the radius of my circle will be smaller. The path will be a tighter curve. And again, that makes sense. If the magnetic field is stronger, the magnitude of that centripetal force is going to be stronger. I'm expecting it to force that curve around more. And we can do the same for decreasing the charge. If I decrease the charge, then the number on the bottom gets smaller. Therefore, my radius gets larger. And again, it increases, it opens up that curve. If I change the charge, then back to left hand rule, the direction of my current is effectively changing, and so it's going to be forced to move in the opposite direction. But the thing that we're really interested in is what happens if we increase the mass. Increasing mass increases the top, makes the, that radius bigger, and it's this factor that means that we can use this induction rule to work out something really important about ions or charged particles. And this is using something called a mass spectrometer. So in this picture here, you can see I've got lots of little dots heading into the page. This is representing a uniform magnetic field, this time actually coming out of the page. I'm seeing that little sharp spike of my dart or my arrow, so it's coming towards me. And with a mass spectrometer, what we're trying to do is figure out what is inside a sample. So for example, for a Mars rover, we might take a sample of material and we're going to ionize it. So we're going to put energy in to strip away electrons to turn that sample into a gas of charged particles, positively charged. And we're going to direct them using an electric field towards something called the velocity selector. And that's what this thing here is. Now, let's take a closer look at the velocity selector. What that velocity selector is, is it is a device that allows us to limit the speed of the ions that are able to get through. And it's basically a charged plate. So I have two plates here positive charge on top, negative charge on the bottom. And we have to imagine that we've got a uniform magnetic field going into the page. So again, if I get my left hand rule out, first finger field is into the page, second finger current, well, it's moving in this direction here. So this is going to experience an upward force. And we know the magnitude of that force is going to be BQV. But at the same time, I've got a charged particle that's in an electric field. That field is running from the positive to the negative. And as a result, my charged particle experiences an electrostatic force. And that electrostatic force is equal to QV over D, where V over D is my electric field strength and Q is my charge. And so... By setting um, BQV to QV over D, I can make sure that only ions of a particular velocity 
are going to be able to get through here. If they're going too slow, then this magnetic force is going to be too small, and my electrostatic force will dominate, dragging it down. If it's moving too fast, the magnetic force is going to be higher than the electrostatic force, and that's going to drag it upwards. But if I get the speed just right, then my magnetic force and my electrostatic force are going to be equal to each other. And this means that now I know what the velocity is of all of those ions coming through my velocity selector. Once they leave the velocity selector, they now go into a uniform field that's coming out of the page here. We know that that is going to induce circular motion and that circular motion is going to follow R is equal to MV over BQ. The radius of that circle is equal to this and we know that both V and B are going to be constant then we know that radius is equal, going to be equal to the mass divided by the charge. And if we want to, we can rearrange this. We can say that Q over M is going to be equal to V over B R. And Q over M is our specific charge. or the charge per unit mass, coulombs per kilogram. And so now this means that the position on the detector that my ion is registered will give me the specific charge of that ion, will allow me to identify what that ion is. I'm using moving charged particles and magnetic fields to basically make a molecule or an element fingerprinter. One that I can use in a variety of different places. If I have, in this case here, a smaller mass, my radius is smaller. And if my mass is smaller, then my charge per unit mass is going to be greater. So let's look at this in action then. Last bit. I've got a mass spectrometer. I know that the ions that the velocity select has allowed through have a speed of 5.2 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. I am told what my flux density is. And again, remember that milli is 10 to the minus 3. And I'm told that the ion was deflected on a semicircular path with a radius of 12 millimeters. Again, millimeters 10 to the minus 3. What is the specific charge or Q? over M of this ion. Well, I just have to use my equation. R is equal to MV over BQ. V is constant. B is constant. I want Q over M. So I rearrange this. Q over M is equal to V over B. Ah. Plug my numbers into this. That is equal to 5.2 times 10 to the 4 over my 200 milli, so 10 to the minus 3 teslas, multiplied by my 12 milli, so 10 to the minus 3 meters. That comes out with an answer of 2.2 times 10 to the 7 coulombs per kilogram. One point to note, I've been nice here and I've given what the radius is. In the exam, they may well give you diameter and you need to remember to halve that to get your radius. So that is charged particles in a magnetic field. There is one more little bit, which is to understand how a cyclotron works and do some calculations. There's a separate video for that. Go and have a look at that and then have a go at the questions.